Greetings once again in the name of the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, the one, the true one, the holy one of Israel. We come together today, this will be a, a communion day. So stop the uh, podcast, get your cup, prepare to break bread. Oh, it's been a while, and not without good reason. And the reason is because, I suppose, there were just a lot of things in my own life for me to straighten out. And the Bible says, at least Paul says, (laughs) the Bible, that a man should should be worthy of the cup, not drink unworthily, in other words, not commune unworthily, but let a man examine himself, he said. And I think I've had time to do that. And where I fall in the whole thing is my assessment of myself is I'm an embattled servant warrior in this fight and have been struggling with my own bondage issues of unworthiness which perhaps is my own thing that I put on myself, I may be too hard on myself. Uh, shame, guilt, a feeling of not doing anything well. And a lot of this is, is um, exteriorly put on me. It was part of the curse of whatever my life would be. I mean, I think every life is cursed to be here in this situation, right, the curse of Adam, the curse of the fall. So mine is particularly that. And I think as I examine myself, I realize, oh, gee, half the stuff I'm beating myself up for isn't even mine. But people want to layer it on you. And perhaps I haven't been strong enough to fight back. Now, mind you, I seem to be pretty whole, you know, I guess, relatively speaking. Some of mine say, well, you're not in such bad shape as that. I said, no one said anything about being in bad shape. What I said is detailed, uh, I gave you a detailed account of my self-examination. Perhaps it disturbs something in you. So you must tell me it's not that bad so that you will feel better about yourself because everything's a projection. Well, I tried to rest up. Today, Shabbat Shalom. This is the Sabbath. This is the day of rest. So we will rest in the Lord. Now, I've... Yes, it may have taken me a while to examine myself, but I feel that I was looking back at the scripture and um, this one in particular, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord But let a man examine himself so that he eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Well, we certainly don't want to do that. And so when there's a check in my spirit, you know, I mean, I I can't schedule anything. Here we are today. I bet you didn't focus on that scripture too much when you were taking communion in the church. 
No, you just line up and go for it, right? And you Catholics, Eucharist, there's no self-examination. <laughs> You're just lining up and doing it almost reflexively. But I think Paul puts into perspective, we don't just come to the cup uh, willy-nilly. No. You examine yourself, you repent, you're sorry, you're grateful for the good things, and then you come to the cup. Without the self-examination, right? a lot of people blend repentance and communion. They don't want to just appear with the Lord and break bread with the Lord unworthily, without thought. I think what Paul is saying here, since he's not qualifying what examining himself means, it just means be self-conscious and aware that you're approaching the Lord here. You don't just come as an everyday thing. Oh, do it as often as you like in remembrance of me, absolutely. But he is still approaching God. I mean, who could look upon God? None of us can. We would burn up. So we approach in awe. Let us examine ourselves. I can't tell you when these are... No, there's, I'm not giving an excuse. I didn't examine myself, therefore I didn't have communion for a while. No, I didn't look at it that way. This is what's going on today. I don't know about yesterday. I don't care. Okay. There is no yesterday for me. Okay. Let a man examine himself, so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. Right. So in taking the... the bread and the cup. We examine ourselves. We stand fairly naked before the Lord, realize that we can hold nothing back. Now, Jesus is the living bread that came from heaven. If any man eats this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. John six thirty three. So the bread is the body and the wine, the blood. Of course, symbolically, it's not like you're repeating a human sacrifice. No, you are symbolically taking the bread of life, the blood of Christ, Acknowledging that you live because of him. Otherwise, everything is dead. None of us can do it on our own. We cannot summon the righteousness because as soon as we do, we fall. We make a mistake. We fall. But in him there is no imperfection, there's only righteousness, there's only joy, there's only the pure spirit. Only in him, abiding in him, can we, do we then attain life. As long as we stick to the vine, we have life. The fruit has life. When we fall from the vine, we have nothing. So let this communion, this breaking of bread together, be an acknowledgement 
that because he lives, we live. The bread is life. The blood is the sacrifice, the atonement for all mankind so that we may live in him right now. I live. They don't live. I live. And why do I live? I live in the eternal realm because of Christ, because of Jesus, because of God, because of redemption, because though I may not deserve it, I can't see anything that I would merit my getting a break here. Exactly. I haven't been perfect. But because of him, I'm acquitted of my crime and the doorway to the tree of life, the blocking, the cherub, the flaming sword, it's removed thanks to the blood. And thanks to Jesus, which is life, the bread, which is also the spirit that animates the world. But unless one is born of the spirit, of the actual spirit of God, which is pure overcoming of all things, well, one has no life. This is where the term born again came, the idea of being born again in the eternal spirit through Jesus Christ. <laughs> Because of that, you see, we live now. Oh, you know, it, it, some of us display our freedom. What is freedom? No anxiety. A fearlessness. Not afraid of death. Not afraid of any man. No. Not living in fear. But rather victoriously having overcome the world because he overcame the world right now. There just isn't anything that cannot be done by one in the body of Christ. All things are possible through the Lord. Any dream, any thought, anything fulfilled, any bucket list is of course doable. Any new adventure, I see that there's new adventures awaiting you. Someone's going to take a new adventure. By all means, do it. Be strengthened by this communion. Let this thing be the, the kicking off, the bon voyage of a new journey. Trying something new at 65 years old. Absolutely, what's wrong with that? Abraham was older than you. And Abraham should be our model for new journeys, <laughs> I would think. But I will say this, that um, that the whole idea of communion was supposed to be, I mean, it's at once casual. There you are around your table. And it happens among the brethren around the table. It doesn't have to be a stained glass church. I think my favorite is kind of the same as the Last Supper, where you've had your, your meal, you've, you're sharing in the Lord, you've done your prayer, and you break bread in communion in remembrance of him. It's almost like he is now taking the place of Elijah, which of course is what he does in the world. Right, remember? 
he takes the seat of Elijah, but that's the final seat. That's the throne of heaven at your dinner table. <laughs> so that's why I think a man must examine himself. I'm, I'm so glad Paul put a little check there to write. Obviously what he's addressing is just people think there's magic in the communion and so they flock to it to like a magic cure, like a washing clean, like a free, a free pass. And he's saying, nah, not so fast. You're approaching the Lord here. And yes, when Jesus was here with the brethren, yes, right around that table. That's right. Right around that table. Meaning it should be as common as, as you like. Whenever the spirit overcomes, rather overtakes or rather overwhelms, whenever the spirit is present, of course, and there's a need, by all means, break this bread and have this wine as often as you like in remembrance of him, but in the presence of him. Remember this, remembrance is presence. Because presence is all we have. We don't have the past. We just have now. So I think I'm going to cut it off there. I'm going to say I'm breaking my bread here off of my piece of bread. I have it. If you have your bread, partake. And if you have your wine, whatever you have, this is the blood. Pour it out that the world might live. The breach healed. Eternal life. The lifeblood of the Spirit. here today. And he will. But rather than focusing, well, amen. And I receive and give out prayer and receive yours in thanks. And if you care to continue this at your tables include. It doesn't matter if you do it five times a day, folks. Whatever is going to put you in the presence of the Lord, that's what it's all about. This symbolically represents the world and life. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the overcoming of the curse of Adam, the restoration of the breach, all of those things combined in the single act of remembrance of me is him and he takes over and in him of course there's no disappointment but in the spirit there's only joy God is a spirit must be worshipped in spirit and in truth I believe we have spoken the truth here today so now music laughter Playing, running, jumping, energy. Because in so doing, you celebrate the thing God created. He created you to, to, to not just be hunkered down and pushed down your face in the mud all day. Every day. Begging for a little relief. That's not life. And that's not what God created. That's unfortunately... This heavy-duty, terrible um, weapons they beam at us, 
I, I just, I, you know, and it's really hard to understand how you could come to a world where you're the enemy even if you are just an innocent one. You didn't know you were the enemy, but you're the enemy. They hate you. And right now they happen to be the governments of the world. I don't know why that is, but all their policies lead to suffering and bondage and pain. Not for them, no. No, they, uh, they live in the fields of Elysium. They, uh, they're sheltered from you. But uh, unless you're in that billionaire status, uh, you're going to have a hard go of it because they intend to make you pay for the faltering economy or for whatever happens here. It will be your fault. They will go unfettered onto their golf courses and in their lives, onto their yachts and their planes and whatnot free from you. Okay. Well, we'll always have this. Let's just look at it this way. At least now, all of this has been exposed. Thank you, Lord. This communion is complete. And now we must go on to whatever talking we want to do. Thank you, Father. I am eternally grateful. I don't, knowing me, I don't think I could get through one day without you, Lord. I'm just that weak. I think I, think I just, I mean, yeah, I could knock it back with a couple drinks maybe, but still, I, I, it's not enough. You know, it, it might help in a way, but it's not enough. It, it uh, may help with the trauma, but it's not enough. It may help me anesthetize a bad situation, but it doesn't sustain. It's just self-medication. It can't help me. No, it's only you, really, Lord, that... And, and despite that... I still need you because I wake up at night, the anesthetization worn off, the nice meal or whatever worn off, and then I think about the world situation we have today. A terrible thing. I think about the fact that there's plenty for all people and yet <laughs> I hear Bernie Sanders yes you see we can have our communion and we can talk about political leaders here because we haven't become slaves of 501c3 you understand that you understand they cannot have that conversation because they are slaves. The Lord never intended us to be slaves. Wow. So what he addresses and interestingly enough, what Donald Trump addresses at the other end of the spectrum are kind of the same thing. You know, it's just that the masses are very ignorant. And so it's very hard for, the, you know, these people to understand that, you know, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money, which has happened now. So, of course, that's never going to help. Trump has been made into a, a clown or a buffoon by the establishment, the people in, in your fields of Elysium that you're not allowed to see. 
And uh, they're trying to limit him to, say, like a Ross Perot type of, you know, compartment. That's how much they hate you. That's why I'm not a Republican, nor am I a Democrat, but rather an independent. Well, I can't sign on to the, you know, establishment anything. But both of these men are outside the establishment and they're garnering the biggest crowds and the most interest because, quite frankly, when I look upon the stage, many of these people proclaim themselves to be brethren. I don't see much. I, you know, I, I don't see the uh, passion the enthusiasm, the energy. I see caution, deer in the headlights. You know, a little bit of, 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 of something from a, from, from, from a couple of them, but I don't, I don't hear the bold passion that uh, we see in the two men just mentioned. Both believe their way is right. Now, the sad tragedy for me is that all these people, if they came together from both sides, would find a lot of common ground, yet they're separated and therefore weak and cannot coalesce. It's a war between the establishment, both sides of the aisle, take your pick, against the people who pay their salaries. It is the sickest of sick things. It cannot even be... The Roman Empire was ahead of us. It was better than, than we, even on their last day. That's how pathetic we are. Anything that gives life, anything that gives freedom, anything that gives hope, they want to swat it down and destroy it. They want you to just shut up, check the box of your candidate, and believe in this pipe dream they call America, which is um, long gone, if it ever was. There is no American dream. There is only an American nightmare, just like there's a European nightmare, a Russian nightmare, a South American nightmare, a, a nightmare everywhere. Oh, sure, some people are better off financially than others, but still the same nightmare. In other words, this constant need for these narcissistic psychopaths to get the spotlight and to get your attention, to scare you with something so you never just have a day of relaxing, a day where you can just say, you know what? Thank you, God. Smell the roses and all that. They just want to take that last bit of decency away from you. I mean, they can't even go five minutes unless you're paying attention. They flip out. So they create crises and artificial crises and fake crises and false flag crises so that you will then keep paying attention to them and then they provide you nothing. All they do is take. This is no way to live. Believe me, I have tried. I've tried to look away. I've tried to lead my own life. I've tried to just have a, a free moment away from all the anxiety that they produce. And I find that peace once in a while, but then some, you know, the news gets flipped on or something. Gets, and there it is again. The whole litany of fear, loathing, they're coming to get you. They're going to take this. For, there's going to be a collapse. You're not going to live beyond next week. It's all terrible. You better pay attention to us. We're the only ones who can solve it. Yeah, I sure you sure did a great job with that Animus River. Boy, you solved that one. Well, that's just about confiscating the wealth. That's, that's about regulating the wells. Having access to wells. That's all that is. Oh, you, you think it was an accident? Well, fine then I guess you believe everything is what they tell you. I, well, I don't think we'll ever know. I'm just saying, you know, qui bono, and, you know, qui bono would say that, well, the, the um, EPA benefits by the a toxic spill in the beautiful Animus River because it pollutes people's water supply, and now they have to come in and save you. Maybe they build a water treatment plant for I don't know how much money or something, but they have to come in and do something with your wells to make sure that you get good water. You know, so they create a crisis, 
And then if they come in as the, the knights on, on white horses, then you know, of course, you've been bamboozled. A problem, reaction, solution. It's a no-brainer. Accidents like that, of that kind of, of that scale, just don't happen. Maybe they thought they'd flush the water out and it wasn't that much water, and then it turned out to be a lot more. I mean, it could, it could be like that, but still they're going to come in as the white knights. Still there's going to be more regulation on your water. The way the water is in Colorado, off the Animas River, we know it's, we're neighbors. It's right up the road from us. And we've spent time there. And, you know, Dasha and Eli have, have gone gallivanting through that river. Um, wells, not just wells, but farming, all throughout Durango and up on the New Mexico side and then, and then across over into Utah as it, as it heads west. You know, the, the, the thing is, is that all, all of that feeds lots of farms and people and families and wells. And all these people are dependent on those wells for their water, for drinking water, for showering, for the garden, for farming, for cattle, etc. It's a lifeblood of that part of the world, of, of Durango. And uh, Durango is a very beautiful place a city with a r river running through it. And, um, you know, they do this with, uh, with the chemtrails, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the geoengineering. And, you know, in other words, they, 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 they basically are there to destroy not just you, but destroy the earth too and the world. And no one seems to realize Everyone feels so helpless they can't do anything about it, which of course is false. But since your conditioning is to make you feel that way, then you remain helpless while they do bad things to you and you just hope that you can get through it. I know I got a lot of friends who are just trying to get through it and look the other way and just hope it doesn't get them. And it comes closer and closer every day. And they're just trying to skirt by it and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to get thrown in jail. They don't want to get them upset. They don't want to rail against the system. They're just trying to go. You know, I can tell you this is the system is going to get you because the system is corrupt. And it won't be happy until it kills every last person on earth. That's the world system. That's why I say Jesus. Jesus is the solution to the world system. You, you know, you go up against the big forces of the governments of the world and how powerful they are, you get crushed like a bug. You know it and I know it, so that's not going to be the answer. But Jesus is. Anyway, so I trust God to deal with it. And you know something? Even he told me today, you know, because we had a pitter-patter of rain last night. It was reminiscent of the old days. And then it was gone, right? Not enough to sustain. The Lord said, I got the rain. I'll take care of it. So I was given immediate peace. And I will take care of the Animus River and all the plans they have, all these nefarious plans of doing all these things. Don't worry, I got this. Thank you, Lord. Now, there's my anxiety gone. Now, all I got to do is watch a little too much TV or do something to get reeled back in to man trying to solve man's own problems. <laughs> Never will that happen. No. The Lord is the solution because he will deal with it. They can think they're going to screw. Well, right now the Lord's on CERN. CERN, CERN oh, they're going to fire it up on the 23rd and 24th. Now, the amount of fear porn out there today, I, and this is what I have to address in the body of Christ, because you people really, really are off the top. I think that's why we had to have this communion at the top of the hour, because, you know, um... Well, I had to examine myself, and I realized I, I was in good stead to present the communion. Well, the reason I'm in good stead is because unlike a lot of uh, my fellow uh, speakers of, in this topic, um, I'm pretty much naked here. You know, I, I'm pretty much ready to berate myself at any given point about things that I'm just you know, not measuring up at. And uh, I seem to be real available, you know, in that way. And that makes me more, you know, 
decent enough to present that because if I came with this idea that I'm doing pretty good or something, you know, I, obviously I can't th then do communion. No, I have to be like, you know, I'm, I guess I'm doing okay, ups and downs, you know, good and bad. But to be anything good, I need the Lord. I'm dependent upon the Lord. I need that bread of life and I need that, 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 that blood. I need to be covered by that shed blood and I need that bread of life. That's eternal life. I need, I need that in order to be whole because I realized a long time ago, folks, that I'm never going to completely heal from, you know, traumas of the past. I mean, a cope, yes. Heal, no. But in Christ, I'm whole and healed, you see. So that dependency, that, that, that need and dependency has to be there for me to present a communion. If for any reason I think I can stand on my own two feet, which I can't, really. And I mean that in a very general way. I really can't. And um, I do know others who can, or at least have the illusion thereof, uh, who don't need. They don't have the Lord. They don't seem to need the Lord. They can stand on their own two feet and be, you know, an adult. And I can't do that. I envy that, that, that wholeness. You know, I mean... I would love to tell my friend here that, well, you're familiar with the traumas I had, you know, growing up, and you know, I've, I've, it, everyone was familiar with how troubled I was as a as a child and a young man. And I didn't mean to be. I mean, you know, I, I just want to say that I didn't mean to be a problem, you know, but I guess I was, or just troubled in myself, and you know, um, and then and then realizing that people wanted to get rid of me. That also, that hurt me very deeply. I, I was very traumatized by that. And I don't think I ever really got over that. And I don't think I ever will. Well, I can't imagine wanting to be gotten rid of because, because somehow you're, the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you're not dealing with it very well. But, you know, the, the idea that you just, you have family members you want to get rid of because they're just not coping right, so bump them off. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I, I just didn't understand. And I, you know what, I still don't. And I never will. No, I will never understand wanting to bump people off because it's convenient or socially acceptable to keep the status quo going. I, I cannot even fathom. So that's like post-birth abortion. Oh, well, this one's just not the perfect kid like I wanted. Okay, kill him. I cannot understand. And then I never will. Therefore, I can never heal, since I will never understand. Well, you'd have to be there, but, you know, whatever the traumas were, you know, rejection or, you know, persecution, whatever it was, I didn't understand any of it at the time because I didn't understand. I didn't understand about the world. I didn't understand about, you know, Satanism. Was, were you supposed to become a Satanist? I didn't, and then go to church. I, you know, that kind of thing is so exotic to me. It's so beyond my comprehension that I still don't understand it. I talk about it a lot, but I never healed from the, um, the mocking and derision that I did not understand where that, why. I didn't, I look in the mirror, I try to figure out, well, what did I I don't look terrible. I mean, I don't understand. I got so much of it that, um, you know, the, 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 the scars never healed. I can cope better, but I don't think I'll ever be able to be, you know, like the people I see walking around on their own two feet. I never was able to stand on my own two feet. I had to have angels lift me up on my feet. I had to have Jesus Christ put me on my feet. And in him I can be on my feet, but, but that's the only place I can be on my feet. Other than that, I fall apart. Because the wound has you know, cut me in half in some way. 
you know, so that it could never, you know, that it, I suppose we could just chalk it up to the Lord breaks those whom he loves, but, you know, I was just, I, I looked at pictures of myself when I was like five and four, you know, at a birthday party for me. And I looked absolutely miserable and traumatized at that age. I mean, I have the pictures. And Trish agrees when Trish sees it. It's, 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 it's horrifying looking at them. It, it, it's truly horror show material. I look at those and I see that, that big bully guy that, you know, told me I would never be accepted socially, you know, when we were like 12. And, uh, and there he is giving me a present. I could, what I should have done is punch, well, he was big and strong. I mean, he could crush any of us. He was a real bully. But anyway, th there I was, very disturbed and obviously completely traumatized. In at, at four and five, I don't know how old I was. Maybe around five. I had a little shorts on, a little suit with shorts. You know how kids have those. Well, it was back in the you know 1960 or something. And um, there was a clown there, I think, and that was even more horrifying. I, you know, it was it was just bizarre. I. Um, but what's curious to me is why, you know, it seems that kids are having a pretty good time. What's wrong with me? And what was wrong with me then, I suppose, is wrong with me now. But it's not wrong. It's, it's, it's just that it's, you know, I can't explain it. In, a, in the right world, it's right, I suppose. Does that make sense? But in that world, maybe it was wrong. I don't, I don't know what the thing... I don't think there was any reason I was disturbed that, then. Um, but there it is. And I think what it really is, is that, you know, some of us are just cut out for the more of the spiritual end of things. You know, some are cut out for more of the material. The ones who are more cut out for the material, you know what I mean? And they're, 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 they're happy with their bodies, you know? They're, they're not ashamed. They're happy with their, their, um, their lot in life. They're, they're, they're very free with their, you know, with their, they just seem all at home in the world, you know? Like, you know, wherever they throw their hat is their home type of thing. They're just at home in any situation very at ease and, you know, very worldly, very, very uh, confident. And I always was so envious of those people, you know, because I could never have that. And they said, but you can have that. And it was like, uh, I guess not, you know, because we're just two different kinds of beings. There's just no, nothing else I can say about it. My reaction to the world was horror. Their reaction was cool. And it's been that way, for, you know what, it's no different at five years old than it is today. Now, in Christ though, with the Spirit of the Lord, here's what we have. We have joy unspeakable because the Spirit is joy. And then I realized the real reality of the whole world is the Spirit. That the world is basically illusory, but the real thing going on is the Spirit, is God, is heaven, is you know, that is the world. That is the real world. This is but a reflection, you know, a, an illusion, if you will, that's temporary. And thank God it's not the real world. So where I'm going in Christ is my home. Where I was born on this earth is not my home. I remember this pagan gal. I remember we were at the M MBD, they call this, like the DMV. And I said, you know, well... I said to her, and she was a young, brash, arrogant, pagan woman who was friends of the gal next door, the woman next door had hired her, I guess, for a massage or something. I don't even know if she was a masseuse, I suppose. Strong, fairly attractive, not unattractive, but it's forgettable now, her face. But, you know, we were introduced and we said, oh, hi, what's happening? 
and something about your home. I go, well, my home is really not of this world. And then she laughs and she goes, <laughs> you don't know where your home is? <laughs> like that. I mean, it was just really a put down and it, and it, and I didn't know how to react. So I, 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 I stuffed it. You know, when you do that, you don't understand what they're telling you. So you stuff it. And now I'm dealing with it now. How many years later? Seven, eight. That's a nice delay. But because that triggered memories from, before, you know, from 20, 30 years before that, that were, you know, the same, only in groups laughing. <laughs> you know, laughing at you. And you don't know what you did wrong. And to this day, I still don't know. And they would say, oh, yes, you do. I say, no, I don't know what I did wrong here. I can't think of anything. If I could, I'd be a sick F like you, but I'm not like you. So I can't think of anything. You can't think of anything. No, I can't think of anything. Mind you, I did all their sins, jumped through all their hoops. But it's, it's the free will they want. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the consent, it's the soul, it's the, it's the thing that makes you you. It's something that I, I cannot give, and so I, I don't consider that to be retaining my, being intact, I don't think is a sin, so I don't consider that to be something wrong on my part. So I can't think of anything. It just seems like I came into the world uh, to mocking and derision the whole way through and for something I can't find out what I did. It's very Kafka-esque. I can't find out what my crime was. No one will tell me. And they won't tell me today. But they should certainly treat me like I've committed a crime. But I, I couldn't tell you. And uh, I can tell you, though, that um, m my history just traces is like a map of, 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 you know, these incidents of, that, that created great pain because I didn't understand. It's like you were, you, you were born in a fun house where everything is laughing and mocking at you and you don't, and you don't, you're trying to find out, well, what exactly, how did I warrant this? And then, you know, eventually you hear the musicians on their rock albums, you know, rock is dead, of course, we know this. I've got a rock song now that Rich, Rich sent me the track and I'm supposed to sing on it. I'm trying to fit it in with this thing. But I can't help but feeling it feels dated. I can't help but feeling it. There's a like a dated, you know, it's it's cool and everything. He did a good job. It's just that I feel like it's, you know, the whole concept of rock seems to me to be passe. You know, I don't, I don't know. I just it's. Uh, it's a weird thing. Well, I think the reason I get my testimony here about, you know, is because there are probably a, almost 100% of you feel like you've been through the exact same thing. And you've been trying, like the Kafka novel, you know, you've been trying to find out what you did wrong from day one. And I have an answer for you. You didn't do anything wrong. You're just not cut out for it. You know, you, there's like two different kinds of people. There are some people that are very comfortable in the world. And they get along just fine and they socialize and they schmooze and they, you know, they have their, you know, sex and they have their babies and they have their um, naughty stuff and it all seems to work out. And then there's you. <laughs> now I'm not laughing at you. But you see, they will mock what they don't understand and they can't understand someone that doesn't have their feet on the ground here, whose head is in the clouds. They can't, 
they're not going to be able to understand that. They're going to they're throw rocks at that. They're going to tease that. They're going to mock that. I mean, you're more likely to, if you hired a prostitute, talk to her. You, find, finally, someone, a captive audience, someone to talk to, right? And, of course, they would look at that and laugh at you as how, how pathetic are you. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's just, there's just nothing you can do about it, you know? I, mean, they've, they, I, I wish I had... This podcast, when I was 16, you know, it seemed that's when, when, when things really ramped up, you know, 15, you know, 14, 15, right in that area. I wish I had had this podcast to listen to so I would understand, you know. There was one point, I'll just tell you, that, that it, where it got really severe with me, where I actually wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to cut my dick off and, you know, and, 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 and just and, 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 and the whole thing and get rid of it. So I did it chemically with drugs, you know. I just didn't want any feeling because I felt like that was, that was like um, in the way of what? Of going where I want to go. Eventually I, I understood, you know, I, it kind of got into balance. But it's because of the way I saw them conducting themselves like the penis seemed to be the, the brain of the operation, and it all seemed to be about that. And I was always about other things, and, and so I was getting in trouble, you know. So I wish I didn't ever have genitals at all. I wish I was just a machine. And of course, that's ridiculous. That was when I was a child. But, I mean, most kids don't have a thought like that. Well, I didn't want to cut it off, you know, some ugly, horrible thing, cut it, cut off a member of, no. It wasn't like that. I just didn't want to deal with it. You know, when everyone else was just obsessed with it. And then the adults, totally obsessed with it because you're a child. With And again, that could have been because of earlier trauma, that, you know, violation, sexual violation, made me ashamed of my body, and then that led to complications later on. I mean, you know, but... Anyway, I didn't cope very well. Other people got, you know, had the same treatment and they seemed to get along just fine. So, you know, it was me. So I spent a lot of my youth suicidal. I'll, you know, I, I, I have to admit that. I just wish I'd never been born. And I just couldn't seem to cope with just the way people were in general, you know, I just felt they were so cruel. And I guess I was cruel too, I just didn't realize that it was not, not just a one-way street, but I mean, obviously I was capable of the same things they were, but I couldn't seem, I, I guess I was weak, I couldn't handle it. You know, this idea of, you know, today even, you know, where they just say, you know, we're going to depopulate by having this fake nuclear war and we're going to, you know, we're just going to scorch them all. <laughs> but we'll be in our bunker, so it'll be cool. I, it's hard for me to get there, you know what I mean? It's hard for me to go there. I suppose I could. Yeah, we get to... But when you know... When I was a, a boy, I knew the karmic implications of things. And I could see the cause and effect of things. So I knew that, you know, running down that road that they were running down. And, and I ran with them, you know, I tried to imitate them. But in the end of the day, you are who you are. If you're meant to go through the mirror, you go through the mirror, right, in Alice in Wonderland, or you bounce off of it. And you just, there's just, you know, you either accept it or not. And that acceptance, it, it, it all goes back to ancient bloodlines. I mean, to who you were and what the karmic thing was, sins of the father. It goes back to it goes back to the ancient. It goes all the way back to the beginning. Who you are. Who you are is the makeup of all your genetic line, all the way back. Not just nurture, like what your teachers said or whatever. And um, but here's the thing, and I'm going to give you the good news right now. Because of all this, or because of the my particular, you know whatever God made, that, that was me. Even though, you know, uh, I seem to remember better days, but it's a foggy amnesia. So, but whatever he made me, made me able to do this, you know, to be able to speak to myself as a child. 
and to, 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 to heal that child. Because you see, obviously the story of the ugly duckling, I'm not a duck, I'm a swan, you know? So once I understood that, you know, with Jesus, I understood, okay, you cut me out for you, okay, you made it so that, the, the, you know, I, I would be just who I am. In other words, the Lord wanted me to be exactly what I am, who I am, how I am, how I react, what makes me up, the, the, my whole psychology, everything, no mistake at all, but all designed on purpose. And once I understood that in Christ, of course, and today doubling down on it, it made me very comfortable with myself and very comfortable to where I could give you this testimony. You can't give this testimony unless you're comfortable with yourself, obviously, because you're bearing your soul. You can't bear your soul unless you're comfortable. Most of the people I know who are worldly, they, they, they've got their souls bottled up. They've got, it's just like, you know, they're, it's, um, they've got their heart guarded too. They've got everything bottled up and it's all kind of a facade. I don't want to live like that. So, but whatever he made me to be, you know, I'm exactly what he wanted, exactly what he intended. And there has been no mistake. Knowing that, I have total confidence. See what I mean? It's like when I said, no, I can't heal. No, I can't heal from all that, you know, that, 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 that stuff. I mean, without him. But then when he tells me it's, I'm exactly what he wanted and he did it on purpose, now I'm, I'm whole in him, in him, but not separate from See, that's what I mean. I'm giving this some clarity today. I'm not separate from him. In him, I find out that I'm exactly what he wanted me to be. Without him, I wouldn't find that out. Hence, I would never, I would never. So in him, I'm healed. But if I ever tried to stand on my own, of course, it's, no one ever does that. Once you, you come to the Lord, you lay it down before the Lord, that's, that's your permanent status. I mean, you're not getting away and then going back again. But it's only in him that I, that I am justified, you see. In him, I am sanctified, I'm justified. Whatever I am turned out to be exactly right. Whatever the foibles are that I say happen to work in my favor when it comes to the being, having fidelity with the Spirit of God. Now, be, being able to speak the things of God, I couldn't do that unless I was exactly what I am. You know, if I was something else, like the people I envy, who seem to have, be such at ease in the world, um, God and I would be blocked off from each other. It's really just that simple. Cause I would not be attentive to that. It's like Donald Trump's very worldly. <laughs> when he tries to talk about God and stuff, it's, 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 it's hard to take. You know what I mean? He's, he's, he's a man of the world. He's, he's like, I'm not saying that he's not redeemable or any of that. I'm just saying his idea of God and the whole thing is almost, you know, um, juvenile because he, he hasn't given it a lot of thought. You know, he's been, you know, he's made his, 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 his life from the world, from his own two hands, standing on his own two feet. I told you I admire people like that. But if he wants to really, you know, but I see how handicapped he is going, you know, with the Lord. He needs help, and I'm sure he'll get it. He's got a good heart, you know, so. But you know what I mean? It takes all types of it's my point. It's just that I had to go a long time before I had that relief. You know, so I, I mean, you know, it's not like, you know, I, I guess let me represent that. Let me re-clarify because I, I think I've, you know, kind of got us on the wrong foot here. I'm sorry. When I say I will never heal, what I really mean is I will never go, go away from my Lord because I can't, you know. Uh, let me put it another way. I will remain broken as the Lord wanted me in the world, but I'm whole in him. So I'm never going to go away from the Lord because that, that I'm broken again and I can't stand on my, you know, it's, I'm never going to be okay in the world to, with the way he made me, but I'm completely okay, 100,000% in him. So it's irrelevant. A, a person like me would be hurt by the world, could never heal from the world 
a person like me on my own, and there's a lot of people like me, so a person like me on my own would never be okay. But in the Lord, I'm, I'm totally awesome. 100% comfortable. And then when I'm around the worldly people, I, you know, we, we all seem to kind of, there's a mutual respect, which there isn't, you know, when you're not sure or whatever, there isn't. But I mean, you know, I'm sure where I belong. And I'm sure where that person belongs. And we may not be fast friends, but there's a mutual respect when you're where you belong. You know, it's kind of a law of the jungle. So in that sense, yes, I'm, you know, there's no need to worry about me. I, I, I don't mean to say I, I'll never heal. These traumas will always bother me. Well, you know, they don't really anymore like they did, no. So I suppose it's a moot point because, you know, it, it is healed in the sense that it's not working on me. You know, there are still errant comments that come from the, from the world every once in a while that, that, that trigger me back. And then, you know, I deal with them eventually. You know, that, that sort of thing. Um, I'm never really going to be able to to understand that compl I've seen them. Well, when I was in my youth, I would see them with sex, okay? And, you know, not that I was all hung up on sex or anything, but, you know, I, I wasn't really. I, I was just, they had a certain attitude about, about sex and the world. You know, sex and the world go together. You can't separate the two. It's like, um, you know, it's kind of a religion with them, right? So, but about how casual, how meaningless it all was, how kind of matter-of-fact it all was, how kind of, they were just kind of hopping out of the sack and on to the next thing or, you know, um, or whatever form it would take and, and with whoever, whatever. It was just, there was a, a casual, casual nature of it that just seemed odd to me. You know, kind of when, it, you know, because there was like with me, with sex, there was always an inner feeling about it. There was always a, you know, there's always some kind of sanctity about it, some kind of, you know what I mean? It was, I, it, it, there, it wasn't something to go throw away, throw away, throw away. Garbage, garbage, garbage. It wasn't like that. When I'd see them act like that, I'd become envious. I said, I want to act like that. You know, ah, yeah, you know. <laughs> and and, I, and I, how do you get like that? I noticed the people that succeeded in the rock and roll business, now rock and roll's dead, of course, but I see the people who succeed in the rock and roll business. Well, if you're still listening to rock, you're kind of passe. If, I would get some new music to listen to if I were you. I mean, nothing is more torturous, I would think, than listening to Led Zeppelin over and over. I can't even imagine. You know, it had its place, it had its time, and, you know, move on, grow up, get on with it. Sorry, but, I mean, that's like the last thing I'd ever want to hear, that and the rest of the bands from the 70s. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I think that that's just an exercise in pure torture. Give me jazz. Give me blues. Give me... Uh, you know, IDM, cinematic scores. Give me something interesting, but don't give me that. Um, anyway, I digress. I'm sorry. Uh, but the casual nature of the throw it away, you know, the sex, drugs, rock and roll thing, everyone was so confident. They were so confident about it all. Ah, just... They they really you know had no awareness of any anything coming after them or you know they they had a empowerment like they were running the things you know and anyway I always envied that and uh, you know it was all 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 the reason they had that was because they were all initiated into Satanism with their rock and roll. Oh, they don't know what it was called. I mean, you know, I'm putting that name on it, but it, they, they have, you know, they just knew that there was a change. And then they got real callous about it all. And they're, they're the people that would mock you and go, hey, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cackle, cackle. And they're just, they just became like that, just really gross people. 
And, you know, they would be the ones dominating the concerts and listening to the records and promoting all the stuff. And they, you know, being cool. And, and to be cool, you really had to have no conscience. You had to really be able to tear it up. And, you know, nerds would go from zero to hero. I'd, I saw all kinds of things. And I just knew, I, I told the Lord, I just, you know, I, I had trouble and I said, I'm going to have to be patient to find out what this is all about, Lord. Well, I didn't know it was Satanism back in the time. I mean, I, th I don't know what happened to them. They just overnight changed. And now you see, folks, now look what's happened. At long last, we have our answer. At this stage of my life, I see them all stumbling at the gate and falling and in great fear and not confident at all anymore, folks. Not, and they may be loose with their sex and everything, but they, they've always been that. But the, the thing is lost, you know, they don't need Viagra for that anyway. You know, a lot of that, that bravado is gone. The bank account's dried up. The, the, the bevy of babes gone, the yacht sold, more and more fear is encroaching, and they realize, oh my God, what have I done? And they're afraid to accept the Lord Jesus Christ for real. I mean, they'll go to church and have their weddings and, you know, eating, drinking, and giving in marriage. They'll do all that like in the days of Noah. And of course they will. Of course they do. That's the reason we had to leave the churches because they were running them. <laughs> it's like, talk about the fox in the hen house. No real man of God would ever accept 501c3. It's just a principle, it's a line you can't cross. It's like, you know what I mean? There's a line, and, and on the other side of that line is, you know, unsalvation or whatever. On the other side is salvation. You wouldn't cross it. It's like going to Satan's side, you know, and then saying it with Jesus. It, you wouldn't do it unless your conscience was seared, unless you were in the club. Then you would do it, but then God doesn't know you. So here you are leading a congregation, and you don't even know the Lord. We saw that again and again. It's like, Lord, do you know this guy? Yeah, he's very fallen. Pray for him. You know, we get that. So there's hope. You know, we didn't, I didn't condemn anyone, you know, thinking they were going to go to hell, but they were just in a, in a state where they needed, and they didn't want you to pray for them. I, it was the weirdest thing. The weirdest thing. They, they, um, they feel so guilty. And when they get older, you know, that, that seared conscience, you may not know this from the Bible, but, I mean, it, it could have been in there, but it, it's just not in there, really. When they get older, they have regrets, you see, and their consciences come back. Now, I spent a lot of time trying to also get rid of my conscience so I could be like them more, you know, and fit in better. And... uh I just couldn't seem to do it. I just kept feeling guilty and bad. And, and, you know, I had my issues with my body, feeling ashamed and feeling like I, the way they bandy about their sex and their thing and their, how they would, I just couldn't even imagine being like that. I, I'd, you know what I mean? I'd, I just, I watched and I wanted to be, and I said, it just wasn't going to happen. And, but they would like, if you had that attitude or people saw that kind of looseness and confidence, they'd say, now that one's going to go far in this world. And they did go pretty far in their law firms and their whatever and their business enterprises and things. They did get pretty far. But there's such a thing called, you know, God is not mocked. What you, I'm, I'm the perfect preacher for all this and for these people. They need to listen to me, by the way, if you're out there. You need to hear this. God is not mocked. What you sow so shall you reap. It may not be at the time. You may have a hedge 
of some kind of karmic protection, but eventually it'll, the chickens come home to roost. You will reap what you've sown. God is no respecter of persons, not me, not you, not anybody. You do wrong, you join up with the, the world system, i.e., you know, em, embracing sin, embracing, you know, you, you get, you're, you're legally on the hook for every murder and every atrocity that's ever happened from the dawn of time. And they give you a reward for that, a pop. And they also, you know, have your soul held in abeyance. In other words, now that you've gone through and now that you've fed at the trough, you ain't never getting out. And people think I better not repent because my children might be hurt. No, they won't. Let me explain why God made Satan. God runs everything. If you're a child of God and you're in Christ and you're with the Lord, why would he not protect those that you have a burden for, your children, your grandchildren? Of course he would. But that's a leap of faith, is it not? Better that, though, than going to the grave thinking you're doing the right thing, because you're not. What you're doing is cursing your grandchildren and cursing your line, and they will be, you know... One generation wake up and they won't be passing through to the other side. They'll be getting rocks thrown at them. And that will be the curse that you left them. Don't make that mistake. Do not. That's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is figuring they can't really come clean with the Lord. Sometimes they'll have a deathbed confession and conversion but usually, these are churchgoers that I'm talking about anyway. They feel they're already saved. And of course, they, they know deep down they're really not. They're just hoping that you know they have that insurance policy. And um, you've got to get yourself back over that line. And they say they won't let you go. They've got your soul, they're going to keep it. And you're just not getting out of it. And anyway, Jesus shed blood breaks that contract and sets you free. Amen, brother. Go ahead and take it. Go there. I may be the only person on earth who's going to tell you the truth about this. About the situation, the legalities of that situation, you know, the, the nitty gritty of it. I, I, well, because in a 501c3, you're not allowed, you can't go there. No. Anyone that starts talking about the real deal, um, they would be booted out so fast to make your head spin. You know, I mean, they would be lock, stock, and barrel cut out and not allowed to preach anywhere again ever. There's just a certain line you can't cross. It's got nothing to do with the government. It has to do with the, what, when you get into the nitty gritty of the satanic and the grip that Satan has on people's lives and families and society. And, you know, it starts acknowledging, it starts getting to the, to the real um, issues of all this. Um, and and, and uh, I always wondered why in the big churches, they never were, like, they said everybody was saved. They never, you know, no one ever really, you, you never got to this point. You never, they never even came close to this, this kind of stuff. This, this, this information here is what you need in order to not only be um, saved yourself, but to save your family. To put your family on the right track, to restore, to be restored. You can't go into death with your soul in the, you know, in the balance somewhere else, that I'm not under your control. If you die without possession of your soul, um, you are a blight on your family and you are a blight on future generations. The only way that you can be a benefit, a blessing to your line, is to totally just lay it down with God, with Jesus Christ. Accept that salvation. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and just say, you know, I'm sorry and go with him. I've, I've worked it out legally. I've worked it out logically. I've worked it out philosophically. I've laid it all out in the Zeph report. If I'm gone right now today, you have all these episodes all the way back. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I certainly make mistakes. But the general, you know, you, you've, the general flow of it all get, keeps getting to this point. 
of what is the actual legal status of me in Christ. What, what, what does it really mean? And what it really means is that bondage of the world, that, that deal made by Lucifer, the serpent, Satan, in the garden, the fall of man, that legal binding, bruise the head and the heel, blah, 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 thing with the, the, the devil, the devil seed and the man seed, that intertwining is bro that, that contract, that, that agreement uh, in the garden, which really a, was really a contra contractual agreement, was it not? That's a very important story. Even the way they laid it out, I could go on and on for hours and hours about that. The point is, that is now overturned. That, that, that's paid off now. That debt is paid. And, um, you know, you are therefore set free. You are a child of God. There is no, you know, there is no repenting. There's no taking that back. You are restored. And as such... The Lord who, who has a burden for you and you for him also has a burden for your children regardless of what their status is and their children and will work even all these. He works all things for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So he will work all things around to get you know your line to, to align. What was intended for harm, i.e. taking your soul, I mean, you're the one with the bad deal because you made that deal so you could, you know, be successful in the world, but you're the one that got the, the bad end of it because, like I said, um, you know, you, you, the, the thing comes to an end. Well, let me just explain what I see. Maybe you can relate to this. So as they get older, you know, not everyone is successful. And a lot of the stuff they thought was never delivered. In other words, it, life just didn't deliver what it was supposed to when they, um, you know, when they thought they were so smart when they were kids and they, and they so brazenly sold their souls uh, for the world system and uh, they got to run around the track and tear it up. And now it's just all come to a stop because when you're old, that, all that leaves. Your conscience comes back fully. Regret comes into your life. You've got a gag order on you because no one can talk out of school because they police the whole thing. You know, they, the whole world. Never let them ever tell you that it, you know, the, the Satan's over here and, or over there or down the street. Just, just realize it's the world. And then that makes it a lot easier to see. And then it's also a hidden supernaturally so that you don't know who's who and what's what. It's very mysterious. But it's the world. Make no mistake about that. And it's that way for a reason. The reason God allowed Satan to have this world and to be intertwined with us. Okay, and that's, that's also a genetic thing. The reason that God allowed that, I guess, is so that in such a dark world, opposite of God, he would manifest himself and be seen all the much more detailed before his children, which couldn't be unless you had a world of opposites, light and dark, dark and light. So he is maximally manifested before his creation, you know, which could not be in a, in a, in a world of all light, let's say. Uh, and then that love, I guess what he's doing is he's receiving unconditional love from his children, just total dedication, and, and he, he wants that because that's what he's getting, especially in this world. It may not be so intense if the world was all one way, but because it's bondage and pain and suffering, he gets, you know, I mean, the world yearns for the Lord to set things right, for justice, for, for so many things that we're going without. But look, make no mistake, when your conscience is seared, you pass through it, you become like those kids I was telling about where the, I was... You know, they, they, I can't, there's an attitude. I can't really even explain it. It's almost supernatural what happens to them. But anyway, that all dries up in one's life. And as my father on his deathbed, you know, he was so regretting of life. So life's a very painful, he regrets. I don't think he even wanted to be here. You know, it's just, but when he was young, he was like the, 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 the life of the party, you know. He was the, the guy that was leading the charge. 
they were all having so much fun, you know. And um, they, I found some poetry. One wrote about him. He's like, even when they're stinking drunk, he still finds a way to get, you know, to 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 to, to drink more and get them to drink more. And then they're falling all over each other. And and he, you know, they would really party it up. And and it became legendary. Even just think the Great Gatsby, you know, that sort of thing. And um, that's what they were. They were really into party. It's just they couldn't go far enough. You know, they would fly to go to. The, you know, to Vegas on, you know, the thing, and they'd fly to go to the different football games and on people's planes, and they'd, you know, they didn't have a plane themselves, but, I mean, they would, you know, really rock it up and rock it out. And, 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 you know, and then later on, my dad got really sick. He used to tell me, you know, he, he burnt the candle at both ends and he, he burned out. And so then from about the time he was 40 till, you know, 45, let's say, to the time that he passed on, which was 69, which is not very old at all. Um, it was, he lived that in regret. I mean, you know, to, just so painful. And it was almost like my brother, when he passed on it, there was a sense of relief that, well, at least dad isn't suffering anymore from this. He had tremendous feeling of guilt and um, regret. And, you know, he, 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 he you know, he, 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 him and my mom didn't really exactly see eye to eye toward the end there, you know, <laughs> even though I know they loved each other, but there were just, he was really, died really angry with her, feeling she betrayed him. And so it was, it was hard to watch, but the main theme of it was for, for a lot of years, he lived in great regret, just regret, regret, regret. And, and when he was the partyaholic guy, the king of the party, you know, none, none of that was happening. They were, they uh, were young, they owned the world, they could do what they want, the world was their oyster, everyone in their group seemed successful. It all seemed to be almost like a fairy tale, until it wasn't. And then you see the rest of the time is the hand-wringing. And, um, I really don't know what, what I, I, I don't look into the dead, you know, so I don't really know what, uh, well, Paul Walker was something that came to me. I, I wasn't looking into it. It was just a, you know, I think it was the Lord telling me that the Paul Walker um, is an unresolved issue. The actor. The, 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 the crash in the, in the, uh, in the um, Porsche Spider in the 918 or whatever it is. The, yes, the... Uh, um, the, the, the incredible um, sort of Michael Hastings uh, fiery end to Paul Walker that the Lord was just telling me that's not, you know, that that will be, he'll avenge that because Paul was a, a believer in Jesus Christ and obviously he was in, in the Lord. The Lord was using me to um, put that out there so that, you know, people know that's a marker there. Boom. There's a tag on that. Boom. And that will be resolved. Just like um, all these games people play here, the 9-11s, all this stuff. Well, it's hard, you know. Let me just get back to this thing about your souls. So look, let's say my father didn't have this idea, you know, didn't feel like he was betraying his friends by repenting to Jesus. I know that's so weird the way they put that. You're not betraying your friends, my friends. You're actually helping your friends. If, if you, I understand that, and I have no idea the status of it, but Sylvester Stallone uh, gave his life to Jesus Christ and proclaimed it publicly. I have no reason to doubt that. And it, no, I don't care if people go to their 501c3. I'm just mentioning about the 501c3. If they go there, it's just part of, I went there. It's part of a process. You, you do what you want to do. I'm not going to hold that against a person. I'm just going to keep that man in prayer. But obviously he had come to the same conclusion. He's a very smart person, a very great writer. He's really more of an intellect than anything else. People don't know that about him. Uh, if you know writing like I do and you read some of the scripts, which I have, you're blown away by the brilliance.
that that's especially the Rambo script. Amazing. Yeah, people don't realize he's a writer for he wrote Rocky, right? Yeah, genius. Um, he's a genius. That's all. That's all I can say about him. But the point is, he 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 went there. He's gone there. He's figured that out. He doesn't want to. I mean, what is he about? Seventy now? Sixty five? Sixty eight? Seven? You know, he's up there in the sixties. Okay. So he didn't want to. You know, obviously, all this has occurred to him, and it's occurred to a lot of these people in Hollywood. And I'm just making. Let me put this podcast out there to make it easier. Go there more quickly than Sly Stallone. Don't have to wait till then. Get on with there's oh, uh, there is redemption for your souls and for your families. That's when when you are with the Lord. The God has a burden for those that you have a burden for. Your burden becomes His burden. That's why I try to say, don't not repent because you're trying to help your family. That's ridiculous. That's a that's a completely backwards way of thinking, and it's wrong headed thinking. I know they try to intimidate you with that, but to blow, throw that out the window. God's healing and God's power is supernatural. You don't think he can keep you in good stead? Read Psalm 23, read Psalm 91. He will keep you and nurture you and protect you and provide for you. He knows that if you, you know, you've been, look, you think you can win the quid pro quo Satan game? You're going to go out and do some bad things to get in Satan's favor because that's what these these people have to do. You know, worse and worse things, right? Well, don't worry. You're going to get into politics. That's about the worst thing you can do. <laughs> They're always doing bad things. Wars and, you know, all kinds of corruption and, you know, uh, just amazing stuff. But a lot of times they'll do it for a pop. They'll ruin someone's career and then, you know, arbitrarily, like, for example, General Petraeus, what did he do? Nothing compared to Hillary, but his career, his life was ruined. And then someone gets a pop, you know, when, when things like that happen. Don't live your lives like that. When you get older, you're not going to go out and hurt anybody. To, you, you've learned all this now. You realize that's wrong. Your conscience comes back. You don't want to hurt anyone. You, you want to be a force for good in the world. Well, the, the, get right with Jesus Christ, because that's that shed blood and body, and that communion we had earlier is the overcoming of this world and, and, and an entry into a world where the things that run this place here don't exist. The idea, just, just think about how duped you were when you believed that if you repent, it would hurt your children. I mean, just imagine if you repent and lay your life down, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior completely, you think somehow that would hurt your children? So that, in other words, what you're telling me is you have total faith in the devil, but you have, who, who is, who if you ever said the devil existed, you'd be ridiculed and mocked, and everyone like nod winks about that. Uh, but if, so you're saying the devil, a created being, Satan, Lucifer, um, is more powerful than God. Well, on this world, of course. In this world, he's more powerful than God? No, there is no world that is more powerful than God. The only reason this world keeps going is because our Lord sustains it. Not Lucifer, he can't sustain anything. All he can do is twist what God has made and twist people's minds into accepting him as God. But it's a falsehood, it's a lie. Let me explain what happens. When you have the devil as your Lord and Savior, okay, you're a blight on humanity and your children because evil begets evil. A corrupt fruit comes from a corrupt tree, as Jesus taught us. You know, a house divided cannot stand. Therefore, how well will your family fare if everyone's forced into the satanic thing? Answer, they won't. People think, well, Clinton didn't get in trouble because of, uh, you know, good standing there. It's like, you just watch, they all pay. Nobody gets away with anything here. Um, what you sow, so shall you weep, reap, God will not be mocked. I just guarantee that's true. I know some people go on a long, long time and just seem to get away with it and may even die. And you think, well, how did they end up 
You know, what, what happened with them? Well, you may not know the tragedies in their life or how they feel or whatever, but um, I guess one, of the, one way they pay back is they die without possession of their souls. I mean, that's a horrible thing. You talk about payback, that's about the worst punishment you can do, even if self-inflicted. Most of these people that, that seem to go on a long time, they either repent or they do themselves in. I mean, they, you don't have to wait to be done and they do themselves in. That's why when I see aging rock stars running around the world, you know, still trying to run and gun and capture their, keep, keep their youth captured by playing on the stage and, you know, having all the next generation love them and all that. And you see the clock running out so fast and you just go, my God, does this guy know he's a train wreck? You know, you're not, you're not fooling anyone with a facelift and the, and the colored hair. You're not fooling anybody. You're just, you're just fooling yourself. I was not saying there's anything wrong with performing on a stage, but my God, when you're trying to recreate the past or, you know, try to keep the flavor of the past, it's no one's fooled. Besides that, you're just whistling by the graveyard. It's going to come to an abrupt halt. You want to be ready on that day to, to meet your maker because, you see, we all meet our maker. We all got to deal with God in the end. So you don't want to be in Satan when you got to stand before the Lord, okay? Because that, I'm just telling you, and you never know what day it's going to be. Uh, but but the, the idea of thinking that being with God somehow is a blight on your children, I, I, you know, or repenting to the Lord, switching your position, is somehow going to hurt your grandchildren, um, lose your position that you've worked for, lose that place in line you had. My friend, that place in line has no, no value in the real world and no value to your children either. God will take care of them. You just get right with the, with the Lord as an insurance for your children, not as a detriment. Whoever taught you that, however intimidated you were by that, however you, why ever you went with that illogical statement, I don't know, but it's illogical and it, it, it's got nothing to do with reality. It's not based on reality. It's based on superstition and fear. And it's, it's, it's not true. It'd be very sad to think that's what's keeping you from the Lord. Or that you can control this thing, like you'll repent when you're good and ready. No. All of us are called to the Lord when he calls us, not when we want to. He doesn't, you know, take orders from us. You know, it's the other way around. We're called in various ways, you know. My way was this, you know, I was, like I say, I was just one of these sensitive kids that, you know, and I, I couldn't, I guess I couldn't become satanic enough or whatever, but I was troubled by everything. You know, I was troubled, 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 troubled. And then it turned out that I, you know, what I thought and what I was troubled by was correct. I forgot to mention that earlier. When I say I will never heal from this stuff, it's like what I mean by that is this. I will never be able to see it in a callous wood like they see it. I will never be able to, 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 to be undisturbed by the you know, inhumanity of man to man and, or the, in, in, the insensitivity and inhumanity of mankind to himself. Uh, the cruelty uh, that goes on. I won't be able to, um, I'll never heal from that. Because I, it's not, because it's, I don't need to heal. Because I'm, I, I have the right reaction. That's what I should have said. See, the mistake I made earlier was I'm using their, their paradigm to denote healing. In my paradigm of healing, I'm healed. But I always was. My reaction was always correct. And, 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 you know, you know, and further to this, not judgmental because I wanted to be just like them all. I, I, I mean, everyone wants to be liked, you know, but uh, it was just a, 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 a bridge. There was just something that went wrong there. I, 
Well, anyway, so happy that it did because that made me keep pushing on in the spirit for answers. And I do know the answers, and I do know that whole territory. And I did back engineer everything. I back engineered it so I know exactly what's going on in this world. I know exactly what the stakes are. I know, I know exactly the way it works. You don't want to be, and I've, look, a lot of people have given their lives to the Lord from listening in here. And what did they listen to? These are worldly people who've listened here. I mean, I, I can't speak for the average, but I know there's been worldly people that, you know, successful people in the world have listened. And, and because of the, the legal framework that I give this whole thing, they could see it. They could understand. Now, I had to come up with that kind of sermon, if you will, on my own because there wasn't anything like that out in the world. I looked for it because I needed to hear it myself. So I'm basically giving the podcast that I needed to hear. That's kind of what, what, what it, how it wound up. I'm giving the one that my father should have heard. I'm making up for what didn't happen earlier in life. And again, the other thing is some people are, are meant for, you know, I guess had this been another era, my parents would have sent me off to the, um, to become a priest, right? <laughs> Right, I would have been sent off to the religious people. That's what they used to do with people like me. They'd send us off to the, to the, you know, because I was always talking about uh, God and the Spirit and things like that. So they'd send me off to the, they'd send you off there, and you'd be cordoned off from the rest of society who wants to have a, a license to sin and do whatever they want. But the, the right, the pure-hearted among us, and I guess that that was it. Either that or what I consider to be a pure heart maybe was damaged, but. What happens a lot of time when there's trauma, like say you're abused, you know, sexually, and you, and that's really an assault, you know what I mean? And it's a trauma if you don't heal from that. You could become what looks like a pure heart, but it's really kind of a, uh, a coping mechanism for, what, for, for the damage that was done. So you're not really a fully intact pure heart in that sense, right? It's just, you, I mean, I don't know, who, who could say? But I'm just saying there is there is that kind of thing that 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 happens. I'm um, well. Here are the things that we swept under the car carpet with in our society. We sweep under the carpet um, the harming of children. Obviously, we don't sweep under abortion, but people have accepted uh, the atrocities. Now, now they're out and out Nazi-like atrocities being done to children, and um, with the consent of the public. And it's just it's horrifying. That right there should trauma, that, that is a trauma. We are all traumatized by that, but we just aren't ex acknowledging it. And um, it's almost like so, whoever put it there can't be changed. You, we can't do anything about it. We're stuck with that for life. And I'm sorry, but of course that's wrong thinking again. That has to be eradicated from our society, and it, 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 otherwise we will be eradicated. It's quite simple. If you have any will to live or survive, you will get rid of that um, Joseph Mengele type atrocities now. If not, you will die. It's that simple. But please, when you're dying out there, don't blame the other guy, and I won't either. Well, that's a digression today. The, the, the main thing is, I, I suppose, there's people listening in who are... And, and you know the other thing? There's nothing wrong with you being in Christ like Sylvester Stallone and making a movie or, you know, doing a business deal or whatever. It's, it's got nothing to do with it. Plenty of people were, 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 were donating to Jesus who were uh, traders, who were, who were doing international trade, you know, trade and on trade routes and trading all kinds of goods and services and um, you know nothing new there and plus Jesus was in the line of David Solomon of great wealth so that's got nothing to do it's the love of money that's the root of all evil not money not success in fact there are believers who are successful in fact I know some that are very successful and you know they it just Basically, um, 
a lot of that, I got to be in Satan. So, I, you know, I mean, there's places you can't go. I mean, there's, you know, parties you won't be attending. I mean, there, there is that. There is a divide, yes. But you're there to be a light. In other words, you're there to be a light so that the others will understand. Nobody can survive that party, my friends. That party is a killer. All you're doing is wasting time. All you're doing is whistling by the graveyard. It's going to come a time where you're going to have to get this stuff right. And you're going to realize that the only way to really save your children, you're going to see your children and they're going to be horrifying to you in their decadence and doing all the stuff that you've done. And you go, why have I worked so hard? Why have I done all this stuff? These are a bunch of, these, my, they turned out to be awful. And it's like, yeah, that, that's another thing. You haven't set a good example. Yes, but do you suffer in Christ? Yes, you do suffer in Christ. Uh, you know, probably people who have suffered because they're different, you know, probably know more about suffering than someone that suffers for Christ in that sense. But you become like someone who is suffering for being different. You know what I mean? The people don't understand you. So they throw rocks at what they don't understand. I mean, it's like that. And then if they're looking for a scapegoat, right, to blame someone to blame something on, they could bear false witness, and you could get in trouble. And the, the Bible says this, rejoice when they despitefully use you. And yeah, they use you. I mean, I'm, I'm well aware of people that have used me, and, and I am to rejoice over it. Born false witness, I'm to rejoice. Just means I'm doing it right. But it's hard. I know that's hard. I know that's hard. I know that you know people want to be popular. They want to be liked. They want to be loved, beloved. There's no honor among thieves, ladies and gentlemen. There is no real liking and real loving in these social groups. There's, um, it's almost an artificial kind of thing. Well, just look at when someone has an illness how they back away and don't want the cooties, or someone has a financial, like a bankruptcy, how they back away and they act like they don't know the guy. Is that loyalty? Is that family? Okay, rest my case. Have we proved it? Have I proved to you that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes through the Father except through him, that he is the one, the nexus between this world and the real world, and the only way to get to that world is through him. And so, you know, you need the blood. You need the bread of life. You need the blood of, of Christ. You need to be washed in that blood, to be set free. And believe me, in that freedom, you're not going to look back because somehow when you're with the Father, you know that all things are going to be, all things are as they should be. All, everything will be all right. How long has it been since you felt that all was all right? Let me ask you another question. Could you die today? No, see there's unresolved. Yeah, uh, not really. Well, you know, that's the thing. You, you need to be ready to die at any time because you, 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 there's no guarantee in you could go out and get an accident in a car and that would be the end of it. Would you want to be in the state you're in right now spiritually if that were to happen to you? I don't think so. And the devil's watching too. He knows. He knows it might be better to kill you so you don't have time to repent. Of course, he can't do that unless it's God's timing for you. You see, you need to reorient yourself to the Lord. He is the author of all things and all timing in terms of life and death. But you're thinking about death more because you've gotten older. And you know that, you know, bad karma begets bad karma. Doing evil deeds gets, begets evil deeds. Be, being on a, having an affiliation with, with evil will beget evil for your, for your line. It's just, it's just, it's just, God is not mocked. Once again, what you sow, so shall you reap. There just isn't any way out of that law. 
And because you can't get out of that law, you've got to get right with the Lord. I know we're t all tempted with the devil and riches and all this stuff when we come into this world and shown a way that seems right, but it's not right. It's no more real than Disneyland. And it lasts a lot shorter. <laughs> it doesn't last. I've seen many a family break up in tragedy and, and things break up and fall apart because it was the karmic debt that had to be paid right then. You know, I mean, I can put it a number of ways, but I'm just talking about the legalities of the situation. There is no real way out of the situation. This is why Sylvester Stallone, in my opinion, I don't know all the details about it, but I always knew he would. Well, good for him that it's it's not not going to the deathbed with it. I think all the rest of those guys on the Expendables and those kind of people and all their kind of I think they're all basically on the same path, you know. He, he, you know, and Hollywood, you know, hates them, right? But they're all they're kind of on the same path, you know, kind of led by I guess the pastor. There would be, uh, um, oh gosh, <laughs> uh, Trish, who is the the guy we like, the Christian guy that um, the actor. He's very active in writing a blog on World Net Daily. Just on the, you know who I mean. The no, the older guy. You know, uh, uh, you know, he was a movie star of all those kind of, you know, movies of the past, karate movies. Come on, Trish. <laughs> oh boy, he's not, well. He's right there. He's got a beard, kind of short hair. You know, he he did a he, he had a, a weight. He had a kind of an exercise thing he was doing with Christy Brinkley at one point. Remember him? Oh come on! No, it just it just went out of my. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Well, you know who I mean. Maybe he's the pastor of all those guys. In a way, you know. Yeah, but anyway, it's not... The funny thing about it is, you know, what was important about Sylvester Stallone is he publicly proclaimed Jesus Christ. And don't you think he'd be worried about his family if there was something to worry about? He knows God is supreme over the devil and so in him, there can be no harm. In him, there can be no regret. In him, there can be no, uh, no deficiency. In him, there is real protection. In him, there is sanctuary. In him, there is victory. And, you know, in him, of course, my heart loves my child, loves my family, loves my friends, loves, you know, uh, I'm going to do better in him regarding them than if I was running and gunning with the devil trying to, you know, eke out my own godhood on this planet, which of course is ridiculous because no man is going to live more than wherever they're going to live. And then what are you going to do? You didn't achieve godhood. You, all the stuff you got is cankered. You got rust. Everything's falling apart, uh, including you. So life never really did deliver up all the stuff it promised when, when you were in your youth, did it? You never really got the brass ring. It never did really work out, and it never will. Let's now be smart and just lay it down to the Lord and see what the Lord does with your life. I told you there's people out there right now, they're ready to, to do something different. Like think about Abraham, you know, just taking off into the world looking for the promise. God's going to lead him. And his obeying God or his believing God, i.e. getting up and doing something, was attributed to him for righteousness and for faith. And from him became the mighty nation. So look, 
You don't know what's going to happen. You lay it down, you think, oh, God, my life won't change. No, when you give your life to the Lord, it completely changes. You don't know what you're going to do. You may just take off in a whole new direction, something you've always wanted to do, but you never had the courage to do. Now you do because you've got the Lord. If God's for you, who can be against you? With God, all things are possible. So you take off and do something new. You don't know where, the, where you know, when you meet the Lord and you give it, lay it down for Jesus, you don't know where the road's going to take you. Some people build orphanages in, in, you know, Bali. I know one, we know one guy, that Don McIlvaney went that way, and he's got orphanages all around there. And, you know, they, you know he's basically teaching those kids in Bali uh, surfing and Bible, not necessarily in that order. Sounds good to me. You know, these are kids that had, you know, basically no chance that now have, you know, wholesome activity to do and a, and, a, and a lot to learn. Well, then they know the Bible, and if, well, anyway, the Bible's alive and well in Bali with the kids. What if he hadn't listened to the Lord and, and gone up? What, well, what made him go off that way? I'm glad he did. I don't know him that well. I know him like I've shaken his hand. I, I don't know, you know, much more about him than that. I did suggest he do a new picture on his brochure, and he did. And uh, put a good picture of himself up there. And I, I felt kind of responsible for having changed an old picture. So I felt good about that. I said, don't go with this old picture from 1972. Put, put up a new picture. And indeed, the new one looked better than the old one. Well, Mike Horsey, our friend, he works at the, uh, now David, the son, runs the, uh, I don't know what it's, it's called, International Collector Associates. They sell gold coins. Oh, I might, well, you know, if you deal with Mike, you'd call, they're in Durango, right? You've heard Durango on the air lately, yes? Durango, Colorado, one of the most beautiful places on earth. Well, besides where I am, this whole area is beautiful in that way. You know, Colorado too, you know, Southern Colorado, uh, you, you know, South, uh, Eastern, uh, Utah by Moab and, and such four corners area, uh, Sure. It's all good as far as I'm concerned. I'm, I mean, I really get a kick out of it. I don't know about other people, but, I, you know, I love the West. Yeah, it's a lot different from the... I love the East, too. I, don't get me wrong. I love all the green and the forest, but the West is the best. <laughs> way, way out West. I love the West. Um... But if you deal with Mike at all, and, and you know, maybe now's the time to get gold coin because they're, they're pretty cheap now. They never really came back to where, I mean, I remember recommending people buy gold from Mike at like $350 an ounce. Can, what a, you right? And now it's come down to, you know, what, a thousand and change an ounce? They're still ahead, but it's going to go. It's going to go rocketing up to five thousand dollars an ounce one day. You know, especially when the the world, if the world gets more unstable, you're also going to see oil t turn around and run back up as well too. You know, all you have to see is a little bit more war in the Middle East and some oil wells get blown up. The next thing you know, the other thing I I like about Donald Trump, you know, even though spiritually I understand he's very, you know, he's. Well, he's going through changes. This is a man going through some changes. He's got a good heart, though, a tender heart. Now, listen to this. Um, uh, so Trump wanted uh, and wants to do this for ISIS, take the oil. He goes, we've spent $2 trillion in Iraq, and how many lives? And China's getting the oil for free that should have been ours. We should have gotten something for our trouble. He's absolutely right. What kind of people have been doing this? This, this is this the the New World Order people? These people are idiots. They're never going to get what they want by you know going to war with Russia and attacking and destabilizing all the countries in the Middle East and everything they've done. But I mean, this whole Iraq thing with the Bush one and two, and now where it's at today, is a joke. Bush one and two should be dying of shame. And now to see this, this, this guy who is, uh, to me, this Jeb Bush is a, a, a man that is quite obviously lost at sea. 
He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a ship without a rudder. No one in their right mind could ever possibly vote for him for anything if they are an intact human being. You recognize someone who is not intact, who you cannot trust the country with. Now, if people would vote for him or vote for Hillary Clinton, then I believe they're mentally ill in some way or having a mental deficiency or being in denial or take your pick. But there's something wrong with them. I don't say that about everybody. I don't say that about Ted Cruz. I don't say that about uh, even Carly Fiorina that jumped on uh, Megyn Kelly's side and when, when the Donald was sort of blathering about whatever. I don't even know what. It, it's not even worth it. But that little thing they got into because of these petty little women and uh, Carly showed herself to be a petty little woman there. She's now corrected herself. Greta was asking her about uh, uh, Donald Trump and kind of, you know, she could have gone off and did everything. She completely covered for him. So here's my, you know, I, I have all these, uh, I'm pretty good at these predictions, so let me just give you this one. I believe that Carly and Donald had a, uh, uh, some kind of meeting along with, with, with Donald and uh, uh, Roger Ailes. Now on the Brett Baer segment, who is the ringleader of the, uh, of the Three Stooges who put on that, uh, that, that so-called hit piece on Donald. Um, they're still not talking about Trump at all. They're, they're, they're talking about every other candidate as if they're viable and not even mentioning Donald Trump as having any chance of winning anything. So they've already, so that, that part of Fox News is cordoned off and doubling down on their position of getting, they, they think now if they just ignore that he's there, they're going to get rid of him. If they, just if, they, if they just feel like they were successful, they're acting like he's already bowed out of the race. Like he's not there. They have these chips and they put their chips on you know, Rubio or they put them on you know, this person or that person. And um, I also noticed that uh, Carly Fiorina is slipping back in the polls again. And she will. She's, uh, she's, she might be good vice presidential material. Or maybe Ted Cruz would be a good vice presidential, but I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it's going to be a real problem if they don't acknowledge Donald Trump and he winds up being the candidate. It's going to be a real problem. Uh, there's a big push. Well, you see, the problem is there's the establishment trying to push him out, led by George Will and others, and they're trying to push him out, and then Brett Baer and all those are beholden to that establishment. So they can keep their mouths shut. It's just horrible how the press is not free in this country. How Brett Baer is owned and operated by the establishment. It's terrible, along with Crowdhammer and the rest of the liars. But we've seen now the root of the problem is, is that show has shown us everything. Well, I'm, I'm talking about politics because we're coming into a political year. But I have a, a, another piece of house cleaning that has to be done today. And I didn't want to do this. Did I, did I put it to rest for you people that are feeling like you can't repent because it would hurt your children? Hey, look, I'm not judging you, man. If you repent, though, then, then you and I are friends, right? We're like family then. But if not, um, I believe your troubles will continue and you will feel troubled in the world because, you know, in our hearts and our souls. We know it's right and wrong. We know it's wrong to run with the devil. We know that. Everyone makes fun of it and says it's all funny with, you know. Look at, look at the rock and roll industry. Look at how rock and roll music died. Look at how the MP3 killed it all. Look, look at the va how vapid pop music and rap is now. It's just like empty, like, you know, empty eyes. It's meaningless. Oh, there's good songs being written all the time in pop and, you know, that are meaningful and heartfelt. And, and you know, there's lots of great singer-songwriters. And, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting the music business down at all. I'm just saying what they've been pushing, what these social engineers, how they push rock with the psychedelics and the whole thing to get a certain, they were trying to do, get a certain result and they got it. Then they flipped over to hip-hop and, uh, and pop music to push that. And it's all about... Um, pushing the memes of immorality, um, violence, 
and antisocial activity as cool, right, for the purpose of the takeover and the takedown of the United States and um, the rest of the Western world, for the purpose of the global communist state to um, take over where the, uh, the people running it will live in the fields of Elysium and enjoy themselves, and while the world will be in a miser misery and poverty they will never get out of, if not just fish in a barrel time depopulation. But depopulation, hey, I've got a message for the, uh, for the elites. You know, listen up. I know they have to listen, so here it is. If you get rid of the population, and if you, if you just go on a mass murder spree, you will lose all your power and will die, because you, without them, you have no equilibrium, you have no way of living. Hope you understand where your power comes from, where, where the, your heart wouldn't even beat, it would just stop. Well, by then we're going to be machines, F. Uh, yes, I know, but you won't be there. Yes, but we can put our brain in a machine, so I'm still there. Your brain is not your soul, though. Something will be missing. Something. You, in fact, it would be like being in a torturous prison of hell. You'll be there without your soul, but you'll have your brain. You'll know what you're missing, but you can never get it back. Would you like to be in that kind of prison forever and ever and ever, world without end? Amen. No, you would not. I'm just telling you what will happen. Uh, this is nothing new, by the way. We've been around and around with this issue. Well, I, st I know there's people on Mars. So who would they be? There's a lot of weird stuff. I mean, there's a lot of things that are not adding up. But we'll deal with that on another show. We're not dealing with that today. Right now we're dealing with salvation, the blood of Christ, the bread of life, Jesus, legalities, Satan, the devil, secret societies, the world. Look at what bread pairs had to do in these people. They've signed on with the devil, right? With the with the with the, with the establishment, so they have to. They can't just say what they want. They have to watch their p's and q's. All right. Same thing with all these politicians. They all pretty much. They take the money from the you know the big lobbyists and the you know the the, the special interests. They're beholden to those, not the people. And so if you want see anything change, you can't elect them that, you know, because they will just, you know, they won't be any different than Obama, maybe a little bit less in taxes. I mean, but ultimately, they're not going to have a tax reform. The reason the tax code is the way it is, is to torture people. And the IRS is just a thug agency designed to, um, you know, go around and, you know, I'm amazed they let us have any money at all. I think the, thing, the perfect day for the IRS would be to confiscate all the money and have them dole us out a check from our, from our work and our labor and our investment and whatnot, rather than, you know, trusting us to have it and pay them. <laughs> I mean, you've got some real problems here. So obviously all that needs for the only way you're going to get a reform in is, is because this bureaucracy of government's grown out of control, and the only way to rein it in is, is you're going to have to put an outsider in there. You're going to have to put, like, Unfortunately, you're going to have to, you know, a lot of people are going to say, I can't vote for this Donald Trump. He's, well, look, how about my objection? Spiritually, pretty much inept, right? He doesn't know the Lord and he doesn't, you know, he says he's never had to be forgiven. And you know what I mean? He just has his thoughts about all that. And it, they just don't, you know, they're, they're just not in sync with what we know. He doesn't know, you know, he says the Bible is his number one book. But it doesn't look to me like it's, if he's read it, it's not making a dent, you know. I understand that, but I still, I understand. But see, that's, I'm, I'm not, I, that's not the, Ted Cruz has got, you know, he's really into the Bible, really a great big Christian, you know, and all that. But um, it doesn't matter. People don't have to be perfect for me. You know, I believe the Lord has called this Donald Trump to, to, if nothing else, shake this whole thing up. And so the Lord's using him. That's what I know. I see the hand of the Lord on this guy. But well, they might kill him. They're not going to kill him. Anyway, so house cleaning. Once again, all right. Uh...
and I'm just going to go over this in a, in a real, um, you know, kind of general way. All right. We're coming up to the sh- Shemitah time, the, you know, this, this, this uh, Jubilee period, okay? And the blood moon on the 28th of September and all the other things going on. And I'm, I'm just going to say this once. Uh, and then we'll, we'll cut it. We'll cut it there and you have a, a, a wonderful uh, Sabbath. Unfortunately, there are some people that just can't help themselves. And they're taking a great advantage of, you know, once again, and it's the same people, once again, cashing in on the fear porn, and, and they just can't help themselves. I mean, it's okay, it's the comet strike, it's the end of the world, it's the, the, the worst tribulation, you know, terrible, awful, stock, every the crash, you name it, the biggest satanic rituals of all time, CERN firing up and doing their super colliding on the 23rd and 24th. When, of course, we know they were fired up. And they took it offline again, but, I mean, they, they've been colliding. Look, the point is, is that um, the blood moon, the cosmos, everything is coming into alignment. That this is the beginning of the end, 2015. September. It all begins on the 23rd of September. The Pope's visit, right? Obama, I mean, you know, I even you, you look online, you see that they posted calendars of all the tremendous events going on. And you look, you know, I can do that too, put a laundry list of all the things going on in any month. I'm, I'm just, and, and look at all the people that have glommed onto it. Well, you know, it's really good business for those people that are selling their books and their, you know, things on their website and stuff by, by really capitalizing on this 23rd and 24th. And well, don't stop there. It's all the way through October, isn't it? But the end of September, I mean, it's really, really going to be bad. That is the end of everything. It's not just one guy. It's a bunch of people. And once again, they're all doing this in Jesus' name. And I hate that. They, they did the same thing in 1987. They did the same thing. And then, then they're saying, well, the Mayan calendar didn't end in 2012. It ends in 2015, by the way, September 23rd, 2000. So now that's on the list. And, and the thing about the Mayan calendar is, is, is it went 25 years from uh, uh, let's see, 97. Twenty-five years from uh, August 1987 brings us to 2012. But now we're, I mean, the Mayan calendar, it ends on September 23rd. Exactly. 2015. Never mind that I'm sure the Kali Yuga, instead of ending in 2025, will be revised to 2015. So they're all lining up and doing it, and it's a big industry. It's a, it's a horror, 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 horrible, terrible thing people do. Instead of keeping our eyes on the Lord, we're keeping our eyes on all this fear. And naturally, you know, they're working in cahoots with the Illuminati to bring about the thing they fear. So they're, in my view, responsible if all the false flags and the horrors befall us then that they've had a hand in it. And uh, I don't know what I can do about it. I'm, I'm just really... You notice today we didn't go there at all, really. I mean, we talked about politics a little bit, but I mean, you know, I'm, they all say there's going to be no election. As of September, it's canceled. Him and the Pope, the great meeting of the uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet, the anti or the Antichrist and the anti- or the beast and the Antichrist. I mean, take your pick. But it's it's just more of this TV show, which is fake. And what can I do? You people jump into that fear porn 
And then you're afraid and you feel oppressed and you're in this drama. And, you, you know, I don't know. Look, look, you do what you're going to do. They keep dragging out this woman's prophecy. She prophesied that September 15th is the end of the world. And they're playing her 24-7. These Christians, and, and why? Because they want people to come to their websites. They want attention, the Christians. It's the end of the world for the, how many, what's the umpteenth billionth time? Since, I mean, we've been dealing with this with Frankie and me, you know, we've, it's like it was beginning in 2003 or so, four. You know, it's like um, from 2004 to now, you know, like 11 years. All we've seen is one end of the world thing after the other. I remember Constance Cumbie had this, uh, you know, 2007 was the, the, the tribulation. I mean, what, what, can, what can we do? Is this the nature of the beast where, like, every generation there's, like, the end of the world, the Antichrist, the rapture, the whole thing. Can we not get away from this? I see one guy, Steve Quayle, certainly, you know, jumped in, and he's made it very dramatic and everything, and he certainly is going to get his pound of attention. And he's put together this whole laundry list of, uh, of things and thrown in everything in the kitchen sink. And I'm, I'm like... I, 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 I've just got to throw my hands up in the air and just, you know. Um, you know, you can list things like, well, yeah, you know, by then we're going to have the World Series and it's going to be this team against that team and that's going to signify this kind of thing in numerology and that's like a 666 event and uh, that's going to happen on September 27th. And that's one day before the blood moon, which is also significant because that means blah, 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 blah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand how these people take advantage of all that? Do you understand how it drives traffic to their websites? People get afraid. They want to know what's going on. They seek it out. They get a chance to sell them on some other stuff. You know, I mean, just, just ask yourself the question, is the Steve Quayle guy a commercial website? Yes, he is. All right, rest my case. You know, I'd trust someone more if they were just giving it out for nothing, but I mean, it's, it's the end of everything, as, as you know, and, and uh, uh, definitely um, the people touting it the most and he's not the only one. I mean, there's a bunch of people doing the same thing. But they want traffic. They want attention. They want to, you know, uh, get the limelight of, of, through their headlines. And they do. And they couldn't do it without you. And I think they give the Lord, I and mean, they give what we're trying to do. It, it's a, it's obviously a distraction. So what will the Lord do to prove that Steve Quayle is not God, but God is God? God will probably thwart everything that's on his list. Just to see what he'll do afterwards. Hey, I don't know one way or the other. I mean, it could be the end of the world. I'm not going to say it is. I'm not going to be... So arrogant as to say, I, I can guarantee you nothing's going to happen. Because, I mean, it'd be awfully tempting to at least have some false flags and things like that going on just to underscore the prophetic, you know, th to make, to get people to think of Armageddon coming up pretty soon. Okay. Enough said. I'm not going to go into it anymore. I'm just saying, you know, this is, you know, I told, I told a friend I was going to be traveling on, on, in September. Um, and he says, during those dates, really? I went, well, what's wrong with those dates? Uh, if it's the end of the world and I'm going to be, um, going home to father, then great. If, you know, I'm, I'm fine wherever I am, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. I want to make sure I'm out there on the 23rd somewhere and the 24th.
What do I think is going to happen then? Um, I don't know. Well, what, should I worry? Should I worry? Should I, a Christian man, worry? Should I, one in Jesus, worry? Should I play God and tell everyone what's going to happen on those dates? The only word in the spirit I get is nothing. <laughs> so we'll see. But all these people are getting themselves worked up, are they not? Oh, yes, they are. And they all think that enhances their walk in Jesus. No, it doesn't, especially if it's not true. Jesus is about truth. And if it turns out not to be true, they go, well, it was a fair warning. Oh, yeah? Getting all these people riled up and, you know, uh, and all that was a fair warning? And if it turns out not to be true, who's going to apologize? Answer, no one. So I want to leave it right there. All right. Many blessings to you all. I pray for your strength and your faith that it may increase as many fold as the Father would have it to increase and increase and increase your faith in Jesus alone. Amen.